Hi, I'm Don. And hi, I'm Cindy. Welcome to Pearls of Liberty, October 13th, 2012. Uh, this week will mark the anniversary of the Clean Water Act, which was instituted in 1972. I think it was October 18th. That means a 40-year anniversary for a very significant law that has really never been observed. Yeah, and the amazing thing about that is that this is law within the U.S. corporation, not, uh, you know, so this is, this is laws that were passed in 1970-ish, shortly after 1970, um, with the influence of the people that were put into the environmental positions around the time of uh, John F. Kennedy, before the massive corruption set in with Lyndon Johnson, etc., and the people that offed him. So the, there, this was a law that was intended by the people that instituted it to create uh, a beautiful environment for our planet. They, this is a law that has never been really applied. What the law says is that the best technology to keep the water clean and the air clear needs to be applied. Now, focusing for a minute on the water, what has happened is that the technology has been developed to be able to uh, purify water at a very local level. But what you have actually implemented across the nation is a massive infrastructure of sewer and wastewater treatment plants that are really the whole infrastructure of all the water, including what goes in, what comes out, is controlled by government bureaucracy, but implementation of this law, the 1971 Clear, Clean Air and Water Act, would destroy that bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy, of course, does not want that to happen. So you have them fighting it every step of the way. And we we're fortunate enough to run into people that had the technology and we're trying to move forward the technology but we're getting blocked so we're using this occasion of the anniversary of that act to remind people of, about that and the the fact that there really are forces in government that don't want the the mafia like control that exists over all the superstructure that's now been superseded by advanced technology. This ties right in with all the information we know about the Keshe Foundation, etc., which we've talked about previously. So, in effect, what the result is here, this law is such a high level that not complying with it is um, actually contrary to the oath that all office holders take to uphold the law of the land. So by implication, virtually all office holders in the U.S. have broken their oath. And this, the, by not complying with the Clean Water Act, uh, could potentially have grounds to be removed from their office. Not potentially. There are grounds to remove them from their offices. And one of the issues with sewage the way it is, you know, you might say, oh, well, the sewage system works reasonably well. This technology, and we have, we'll have all the links in our notes, this technology, as Don mentioned, is very, it's extremely localized so that you can have your own little water recycling plant on your property. The tank fits within uh, the same amount of room that would be taken up by a conventional septic tank in a, in a yard and the water that that is returned after it goes through this cycle is actually healthier than uh, you know what we would get out of the tap in, in any city in the country. It has an alkaline balance which is extremely healthy and it's it's completely pure and not, this, we're not talking about gray water that you do your laundry in. This is complete recycling of water. 
so that the water is able to be it, it's it's drinking water when it when it goes through the cycle so the, the, the issue with sewage systems is that most of the a lot of the big pipes are what we would call pipes uh, a lot of the, you know I think professionals call them tiles but they're made out of clay and they have cracked and very large amounts of sewage and toxins frankly have seeped into the water table and the pH of the oceans has actually been changed um, not for the better so th this you know having our sewage systems the way they are currently has sweeping negative implications for the planet so and you know this this Clean Water Act is, it really is in many respects uh, a kind of a hidden solution yeah and I want to take this opportunity to emphasize that the people that are calling themselves environmentalists and talking about sustainability by and large do not know the stuff that we've just explained they're talking about fake solutions because the the fake solutions have been sold in order to keep the current power monopoly structure in place the the powers that be do not want to release this new technology that puts the power back in your hands because the bureaucrats and the the, the current power structure needs to have a centralized system in order for them to to control the thing that they do not want and fight at every turn is anything that puts power back into the hands of the people and will destroy monopolies because the government ultimately is the monopoly of systems like food and water not f food in the sense that the FDA controls what can legally be sold etc and water they control the, the city sewer and water systems all, all across the country it's a massive cabal and it really is the, the guy that explained this to us and is the inventor of a holder of several patents that is for this clean wastewater technology said that the the government really is it really is the sewage and wastewater system masquerading as government because they control so much all of the the bonding of public bonds across the country in all municipalities nationwide uh, the the amount of the money that is controlled by those entities is huge and you put it all together it probably rivals the Federal Reserve in terms of the amount of money that it controls or at least the the control over the infrastructure I believe that the gentleman who we heard speak if memory serves told us that about 50 percent of revenue comes into municipalities in the form of uh, fees for water and sewage so yeah this would if instituted the system would um, if it was a sweeping all at once uh, it would collapse the bond market um, but you know it doesn't need to come that way it can come gradually and there can be solutions but you know the, the bond market is corrupt anyway it's part of the Ponzi scheme so uh, if you really hold the bond market in high regard, you would be upset by this. But uh, if you want to see justice and a cleaner earth, then you could probably get fairly excited about this. Yeah, just that there are on more and more fronts, everything we talk about really leads to the awareness that this is the end of the line for the current system. It really cannot go on much longer. I think we're talking a matter of weeks and months at most in order for, and many people are already saying the system is already collapsed, it's just a, a facade is being held up to keep you from knowing that it's collapsed and meanwhile all of the, the real money is moving out of the country and uh, there, that there's going to be massive problems when the whole fraud is revealed and we're, we believe that there is so much hope that we'll press through and there's it's it's not a time to give up it's a time to rejoice because only people that are 
living in La La Land and still believe that we're free in America and the future is rosy and you can do anything if you're an entrepreneur, um, only those kind of people believe that there isn't a problem. I mean, you have to be a total TV head not to know that we're on the verge of some very turbulent times, but it's worth pressing through because in this next several years where it's going to be really tough because there, there's hope for real freedom. There, are, There's now such a large awareness if you connect with people on the internet and different news sources that are not controlled, it's it's going to be a new golden age. It's going to be awesome. And the the enslavement mentality that people have is going to be broken and people are going to regain their personal initiative, their sense of responsibility, etc., etc. It's going to be hard work, but that's the opportunity that we have before us. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what Don was talking about, you know, you might say that we would know if the economy had actually collapsed. You know, if you run out of gas in your, when you're driving your car, uh, the engine sputters out, but if you have a little bit of momentum going, you, you coast for a while. So we're not always aware when a change has already taken place, and it, it well might have. And we uh, wanted to touch on uh, just the idea of um, channeling different entities, a lot of, a lot of truth or uh, intel, I, maybe I shouldn't say a lot, some intel uh, flows from people who believe that they're in contact either with the, the spiritual realm uh, or with high-level um, justice-loving aliens, or both, and we don't entirely rule that out. We do believe in angels, and we it, it's just a fact that throughout human history, angels have communicated with people. We don't entirely rule out the possibility of aliens and, you know, the telepathic communication, um, not really a big hurdle. Um, but recently, we couldn't, neither one of us could remember where we read this, but um, one person who had believed that he was channeling the Galactic Federation, which is allegedly good aliens, learned that he was channeling greys, who are bad aliens. And, uh, you know, it's like a box of chocolates when you channel. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah, and... I'm not going to say that if you're a Christian and you profess Jesus that you're immune from deception. That's, that's the last thing I'm going to say. But you, what, what it amounts to is you have to have a living, active, personal, daily relationship with Creator God and have personal experience of His character and His goodness when you open yourself up to the divine, to spiritual beings to have input into your life, it has to be via that personal relationship. It's just like if you know somebody that you trust personally, you go to them, you're going to know that what they say is trustworthy. Well, it's like that with spiritual beings as well. So you have to be operating in that capacity and, and bringing everything to God that you know that that being that has your whole trust that you've in our cases given yourself to and dedicated your life to and who also respects your personal free will and doesn't want to make some kind of robot out of you. That's the two-way trust that exists between the Creator and His created beings that He's entrusted this planet to. So, yeah, there's a whole lot of dynamics going on there, and there's there are things that are coming out that 
there's a lot of disinfo flying around now not in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm to the point where sometimes we don't know what to make of things and we're going to get into a, a couple of little details along those lines and, and some of the following items. So, uh, you, you know, if you've, if you've been listening to radio programs for a while like Coast to Coast, you've probably heard CIA guys talk about remote viewing and uh, you know I don't disallow I don't I don't consider everything they say false but I don't consider everything they say to be true either because um, like Don said you have to use your discernment you have to know the being that you're communicating with and I mean it's you know when you're a Christian you've been praying all your life and you encounter God, I mean, that, that, that's, we just have a sense of rightness. Um, it's difficult to tell, and we were talking earlier about uh, the book, um, The Beautiful Side of Evil by Johanna Michelson, and if you're not, unsure, uh, I, I'm not sure I, if, this, if I read that book at this time in my life that I would agree with it 100%, but um, it's an interesting read and it's kind of a way to uh, at least be open to examining your spiritual experiences to see if they're I don't want to use the word genuine but you know who maybe it is that you're encountering when you're encountering an entity. Sometimes the truth or people, zeitgeist, all that, there's always a questioning of traditional beliefs and uh, whether or not the Bible is historically sound, whether or not the Bible is spiritually sound, and as it as it there's a kind of a sense that we're about to move into the next phase. The cabal seems to be weakening. There's promise that uh, you know arrests, so on and so forth. But we know that the way these kinds of networks work, and I'm talking more in the spiritual dimension. There's always some new deception, some new snare, some new trap uh, just around the next corner. And we've been wondering if perhaps that might be um, just a real challenge to the foundations of Christian faith. Yeah, I think our, our faith is going to be challenged, but I think we have to be very sure of what our foundations are in order to not become reactionary and miss out on the opportunities for new God-given freedom that will be available to us. And I'm, there's a lot of people, a lot of Christians in particular, that if they can't find it in the Bible, they'll they'll think it's not true, and I'm sorry, but that's a recipe for deception because even the Bible says itself in the book of First John that the whole book couldn't contain everything that Jesus did. The world couldn't hold all of the books if all of those things were written down. So it's that's an argument from silence that is invalid. You can't prove something is not true because it's not in your book there. The I'm going to surprise some people by saying that, or maybe not, if people know that I'm a Christian, I am, I do, am a believer in scriptural inerrancy, in the inerrancy of scripture, but I am not a King James person. I'm not a, you, it's got to be this translation or that translation. What I mean when I believe in the inerrancy of scripture is that I believe that the words that were given to the individual writers were inspired by God and were written down as inspired in the original languages that they were written. So we're talking about what's called in uh, Bible scholar terminology as the original autographs. So I believe in my, this is my philosophical foundation, this is my bedrock in terms of understanding what truth is, this is a gift of God, that God has given us the scriptures and faithful men have recorded and passed them down. 
some people will focus on the the passing down and the corruption and they'll talk about and they'll focus on the rulers that can that gather together the Bible as a way to control people. Some some liberty minded people are so oriented in that direction that they, in my opinion, miss the forest for the trees and don't see that there is a and there was and always has been a remnant of people that knew God's truth and that these controllers that were trying to herd people by means of the scriptures were not able to introduce such deception as would lead completely off the course or even incrementally lead people off the course. I personally believe that the scriptures are God's gift to us in that impacted our faith in such a manner that that kind of deception is not possible. So again I'm talking about the original languages and there's I am with those who say that if you're talking about differences between translations, those are can be significant, but they are not significant enough to disprove the Christian faith. There's nothing of that magnitude in terms of the differences between translations. Yes, some translations are stronger, more faithful to God's truth than others. I understand those that like the King James Bible, that don't believe is watered down. However, I also am very firmly in the camp of people that God speaks to you in the language today. The New Testament was written in street Greek. It was um, not classical Greek. It was, uh, it was Koine. It was the, the, the Greek of the marketplace. And that is the way that God wants to, to speak to us where we live. So I like modern translations, even paraphrases. I love the message um, that uh, other people might not feel that way, but that's fine. That I know that there's lots of content in the these and the thous and the different structure that's been lost in the English language. I, I give value to that. Getting off into kind of side issues, but the main point is this, that the God's word is my foundation, but I am not a proof texter. I am not somebody that's going to say, well, that's false because of this scripture. I'm always looking at the big picture, and one of the, the rules of that I go by is that Jesus expresses God the Father perfectly. That was what he did. And if you can't see something in the character of Jesus, then it's probably not in God. But a lot of people ignore some things about Jesus, like him taking a whip to the money changers in the temple. So we have to be very careful how we read scripture and don't apply our personal filters to. So going back to the main idea, we have to be, in coming into this time, where everything's going to be flying around, there's all kinds of different spiritualities, I would encourage Christians to be flexible. And you will have, I predict, if you love God, you will have great friendships with people who also love God, but might not be familiar with the scriptures. Because there is going to be a, a childlikeness that's going to happen as we go into the, this new time. And God really loves that and really honors that and wants us to be exploring this world of wonder and enjoyment with with one another. If people want to say that uh, the scriptures have been corrupted over the years as they've been copied, the scriptures that were found in the dead, among the Dead Sea Scrolls um, matched up quite accurately. There had been changes here and there, so um, I personally believe that it, there was a miraculous process through which uh, the Bible has been preserved. And, and uh, I know there are a lot of arguments against it, I understand. It's just, just what I've personally chosen to believe. And, and some of the, just feels like, you know, people want to erode away, not people, but um, the foundations of Christian faith can be eroded away. And it reminds me of um, in the middle of the 1900s, I don't know specifically when it began, but 
denominational seminaries who were funded by Rockefeller uh, began to teach seminary students who wanted to become ministers that the miracles in the Bible couldn't really have happened and uh, it, there was a big intellectual push and what I'm hearing seeing reminds me to some extent of that there's just this effort to deny some of the real foundations of Christian faith and uh, I'm not willing to give up some of them <laughs> so should I move on yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, there's a possibility that, in the, I'm sure you've heard this rattle around, um, that the Federal Reserve notes are going to be pulled off the streets and replaced with U.S. Treasury notes. And there's some talk that that might happen in the very near future. Uh, Again, this, I guess this goes along with the idea of financial collapse. Yeah, that would be pretty exciting. And, uh, of course, people that have studied these things know that that's actually what Kennedy wanted to do. He wanted to put the Federal Reserve back under the control of the U.S. Treasury, and there was actually a, a $2 bill that was a U.S. Treasury note, and uh, there was an executive order that had to do with the Kennedy beginning to take control. I think I see a lot of evidence that that, that man uh, was killed for a number of reasons and that he saw through the the Federal Reserve and he saw through the CIA and the Vietnam War, the military industrial complex, any number of things that that are the the keystones to this cabal. So the fact that we might be coming back into an era where this nation actually controls its money and hasn't abdicated its power to this foreign cabal of bankers that are unaccountable, I think that's really exciting. I think that, that they still, the bad guys still hold a lot of power and will do everything that they can to throw a monkey wrench into any kind of a transition and use that as an excuse to say, look, see, we've got to stay in charge. Always remember, problem, reaction, solution. Problem is created in secret by the people that want to uh, lead things their way. So then you have a reaction to the problem, and the reaction is the one that's by the people that is reactionary because they don't really see what they're reacting to. And then the solution is what the covert operators creating the problem intended all along. So that's what we should be aware of in order to guard against any number of opportunities for false flags, attacks on the internet, which is our free speech town square of, of today, and any number of false starts on a new monetary system. Uh, having said that, I think that uh, there are people that are probably fearful when fearful of false false attacks and false flags, when there may not be that happening, when this uh, when the new global money system comes in, I think we'll be able to judge it based on the the freedom that it gives nations to opt out, and whether or not that's a sincere offer or whether it, it's not. And I think it'll take some time to for that to play out because you can always tell the, the, the fruits of love and freedom and liberty for their ability to give a free choice. The enemy is always trying to enslave and always trying to give you the appearance of free choice, but it takes a while to sort out what's real and what's not. So I expect some confusion in that, in that arena in the monetary system in the years to come. It's going to start playing out pretty soon, I think. Well, in one aspect of uh, the monetary system, the, the uh, regional monetary system, uh, whether people were allowed to opt in or not, opt out or not, was the um, European Union and they won a Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> for which Ron Paul was nominated but 
they edged him out. I think it was extremely interesting that Ron Paul was actually nominated. What that tells me is that, that within the, the power structure nomination process, there are people that are the good guys, that recognize freedom, liberty, and, and what is good for humanity. And those people nominated Ron Paul, of course. But the people that won are still the bad guys because it's just ridiculous that the European Union that's been going in the direction of a police state and stomping out people's personal rights to resist and putting bankers in charge and unelected bureaucrats in charge of nations and taking away sovereignty and freedom, well, that's the wrong direction. So remember, these are the people that, uh, you know, this power structure that nominates people worldwide. Uh, I'm, not the same organization, of course, but Hitler was Man of the Year. What does that tell you? The Times Man of the Year. I don't think he won a Nobel Peace Prize, but hey, I don't give much credit to this this Peace Prize going to the European Union. It just tells you the deception. And if you listen to Alex Jones and some others, you have been hearing them talk about um, financial collapse, collapse the dollar. You have also been hearing them talk about imminent war in the Middle East. And this week there was uh, a letter that brought us hope that was written by Keshi, the man whose name is given to the Keshi Foundation, who has developed a lot of technology that has potential to raise humanity to a new level in a, in a positive way. And the, in this letter he uh, stated that Russia and China are going to back Iran if Israel slash U.S. government, and he was nice enough to not include all of us, um, that if, if there is an attack on Iran, um, all bets are off, Russia and China will completely support Iran, and uh, basically the letter is just saying, don't even, <laughs> and, uh, but it's, it's not threatening, it's, it's, uh, it's all about peace, hey, we all want peace, okay, get it, or else, kind of. Yeah, anybody that is still believing that President of Iran, Ahmadinejad, actually said that he wanted to wipe Israel off the false of the map, off the face of the map, I have to tell you, you're you're listening to propaganda. He did not say that. It's a mistranslation, and you need to search that out. And you need to find out what's really going on. It may be po it it may in fact be that Iran does have nuclear weapons, but I don't think that they want a nuclear war. Remember that Pakistan has nuclear weapons. They're not nearly as sophisticated uh, people as the Iranians. So uh, it's just an excuse to to try to invade a country that has an independent economic system and wants to sell its oil to other nations not and not denominate those sales in dollars. It's all about control and being able to control the oil money. So to take a step back to explain that, when the dollar was moved off the gold standard, what it actually happened was the dollar went on an oil standard because Kissinger and Nixon arranged these deals with the oil countries, the Saudis and, and other Arab nations, and then the, the arrangement went global that the in agreement for buying up U.S. Treasury bonds, they we would buy oil from them. Of course, that's the real reason why U.S. oil, can, we haven't drilled for our own, own oil in, we have abundant reserves, more than enough, plenty. But it's this artificial scarcity and, and it's this control that lies at the root of the problems. The control is at the root level, it's a banking control because the, the dollar was not denominated 
in in gold anymore. Now I'm not a fan actually of, of necessarily having a gold backed dollar. I think that needs to be backed in real assets so that things don't just get based on nothing but you don't want to artificially pick something scarce to, to value it on and real assets can include anything that's measurable and tangible um, so we should be very flexible in what we use as and value as money but we don't want to necessarily have that be completely commodity based and getting into a thing on that but there's there's so much that we can do that would help to move us in the direction of freedom but first we have to understand the, some, at least some of the major mistakes that have been made or deliberate more often than not actually deliberate deceptions that have been perpetrated against the people to keep us enslaved so do your re research as we move into this new time and one significant uh, aspect of um, life in the Middle East and government in the Middle East is that Benjamin Fulford stated in his blog this week that the Middle East is going to be uh, to some extent under the care and guidance of Turkey which is a sort of restoration of the Ottoman Empire um, at least to some extent yeah, the Ottoman Empire was actually broken up by the Western powers because they didn't like it being too powerful. So we're at the end game of the Western domination, which means some things will be reverting back to the conditions before there was this artificial Western Empire. There's an ebb and flow of power, and uh, often that that has actually been based on deception. And those that have studied history in Western textbooks Obviously, we tend to have a Western viewpoint, so this is the time to get out of that viewpoint, see things from other perspectives, and people like Benjamin Fulford help tremendously because they're Western educated, but they've been living in the East, so they have uh, a deep understanding of work from working with the Eastern people and, their, and know what their understanding of history is too. So the Chinese, the Japanese, and uh, all of the uh, Asian nations in particular. The, the base of power in the whole world is shifting and it's time to learn to understand others' worlds and Americans in particular have been dumbed down and don't think outside of our, the world being all about America. So yeah, again, get out of that box. It strikes me as kind of ironic and humorous that uh, four years ago when Obama was campaigning, he was photographed carrying some book that was uh, something about the U.S., you know, not being the center of the world. And the irony is that um, we don't want the U.S. to control the world. Sure, we've all gotten a free ride. We all have nice stuff for very little money. But it's not conducive to liberty and we're all becoming aware of that so uh, it's not going to be a post-american world um, because we'll still have our country and we'll be able to express who we are for real without having it handed down to us from above i can't remember the exact title of that book that obama was carrying but a lot of people keyed on that and said that you know he wants to not make america great anymore and and we're not saying that America can't again be a leading beacon in the free world. We want that uh, opportunity and we, we believe that Americans are capable of rising to the occasion once they know the truth. But realize this, that the people that are the global rulers, the, the elite ruling class of globally that have managed these paradigms of nation shifting and, and created these world wars through manipulating the psychology of the, of the people of different nations. These people want to stay in charge and they do not want other nations to rise up other than they know that the power needs to shift and so they want their intent is to make China the new America. They want China to be the new empire of the future. So 
Indications are, though, that the Chinese are wiser than that and they won't fall into the trap. So we need to be praying for them. And, and I, as a Christian, know that the, the gospel hasn't fully penetrated that area and that as that happens, there will be a greater awareness of the, the enslavement techniques that have been used uh, against them and the opportunities that we all have in order to go into the light as we all learn together. That's the key, is to know that we are brothers, know that, there's, that humanity has been manipulated, and to know that we need to recognize that sociopaths and psychopaths are attracted to government and we need to decentralize power in order to live free. And that, that means all of us globally. So, to better days and thanks for watching. Yeah, see the world the way that it really is. See yourself in it. Walk your walk. You are the one that you are waiting for.